All right. Well, hello, everyone. Again, um, I'd like to officially welcome you to today's webinar, Exploring Implicit Bias and Perception in Your Service Year. I'm Calvin, a training coordinator with the Corporation for National and Community Service, and I'll be the host for today's webinar. I'll also be facilitating the live Q&A near the end of the session, and you'll hear me throughout this presentation. Also joining us are uh, Indy and Jessica, our partners at Education Northwest, who have helped to prepare today's webinar and will be managing the WebEx technology. You'll also see them in the chat and Q&A to help address questions that you may have during the session. Uh, I'd like to introduce our main speaker today, uh, my coworker and pal, Ali Smell. With over 10 years' experience in a variety of fields, from community economic development to diversity and inclusion to public affairs management, Ali Snell joined the Corporation for National and Community Service in August of 2015 uh, to, help, to head up the newly created Office of Marketing, Outreach, and Recruitment for AmeriCorps VISTA. In her previous role as Director of the Peace Corps Office of Diversity and National Outreach, she led the, agency volunteer, she led the agency's volunteer volunteer diversity recruitment efforts, um, redesigned agency policies and practices on diversity and inclusion, trained over 200 recruitment and overseas placement specialists, and set the creative direction for Peace Corps targeted outreach and marketing efforts. Ooh, that is a mouthful and a very lengthy resume. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Ali. Thanks, Calvin, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm really excited to re be presenting to you and hope that you can enjoy today's conversation. We do want this to be a conversation, so as much as possible, please use the chat box as we are going to uh, go through and ask you what you're, we want you to tell us what you're thinking. Now, we obviously won't have time to address everyone, but know that we'll be monitoring the chat box throughout, and we really hope to have a productive dialogue. Totally. Now, as Calvin said, we both work for, for the Corporation for National and Community Service at the headquarters in Washington, D.C. You know where you are, but we you know where we are, but we want to know where you're serving. Please take a moment to use the annotation tools on the upper left side of your screen. Click on the one that looks like an arrow to the far left and use it to point to where you are serving currently as an AmeriCorps VISTA member. Ooh, look at that. Oh, we got Texas in the house. Uh, I'm always shouting out Texas because that's where I'm from and I love it there so much. I'm from Waco. All right, New Hampshire in the house. That's where I'm from. Surprisingly, people from Alaska. Come on, Alaska. All right. It's early in the morning. Thanks yeah. for joining us. Yeah, all right. This is early. We got most major, most, I don't say major states because that's kind of like, you know, ranking states and elitist a little bit. Uh, what's the square state right in the middle that I can't, that no one's from? <laughs> Is Wyoming. That, is it Wyoming? <laughs> yeah. Do we have no one from Wyoming? We have someone in Puerto Rico. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, also, a note about this um, is that if you are joining us from a tablet or a smartphone, this feature may not work for you. Um, it works really well on a desktop or laptop computer, but not so well over phone um, or tablet. That's just a side note. All right, cool. We have so many people. This, this is, is amazing. Great. We have I love quite geograph a, a geographic diversity, so that's awesome. Oh, wonderful. All right, cool. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, let's clear that screen. All right. All right. So today's goals um, and today's webinar is really it's about implicit bias, and our goals for today are really to dive right into the subject learn how it can affect your daily interactions, um, explicitly it can, uh, how it can aff affect your VISTA service. We also want to take a look at how our own personal biases affect our work in the community, as well as develop a basic common language and framework for working in an intercultural or multicultural environment. So before we get, to, before we get started, let's just take a second here and take a little pause. I want to do a temperature check to gauge where everyone is coming from in regards to the topic at hand. Um, I know that I'm just going to come out and say just really quickly there's been a major shift um, in the news and we know what's been going on in the country. Um, as we go through this kind of presentation, I want to just first designate this as a safe space. So we're here to talk today about um, a very difficult subject, and um, I just want to first say that this is a safe space. You know, while we are recording this, you know, we're here to support you as VISTA members in your service, and we're hoping once again we can have a productive dialogue. 
you know, hopefully many of you sitting in this presentation have the chance to take the Implicit Association Test or the, the IAT. We're going to discuss the psychology behind bias and how the IAT attempts to measure indicators of bias. In the chat box, please let us know how familiar you are with the concept of implicit bias. Now, I recognize that some of you may have never heard the phrase before or heard it in passing or may be vaguely familiar with it, while others may have taken an entire college course on it. Some of you might be experts in this area. We really want to get a feel for the general level of comfort with the subject and, you know, where did you first hear of implicit bias? Is this your first time hearing about it? Yeah, and I know if, like, for me it was a fairly new phrase. I mean, it doesn't look like it for some people. I mean, someone said they were an African Studies major, so they've learned quite a bit about this. Uh, someone said I'm pretty familiar with the phrase since I studied psychology in undergrad. Familiar, very familiar. So we've got a lot of people here, it uh, looks like, who have some good experience. Um, as someone says heard it, but no real grasp on it. Um, and that's okay. That's what we're here for. That's what we're going to talk about today and kind of de dive in a little bit to this. Um, for me, it was a pretty new phrase uh, that is, like, a concept that I had always been aware of, uh, but kind of didn't have a word for. You know, like when I was younger, I sort of recognized, you know, that people who I knew were really nice and had very positive intentions, um, you know, but occasionally they kind of treat me a little differently uh, than everyone else, and I guess that's the word for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so we're also curious to know about your reactions to the implicit association test, or the IAT, uh, the link that we sent out before this. Um, so if you were able to um, answer the poll question on the right side of your screen, uh, I think that, oh, it is closed already. Sorry if you didn't get to it. Uh, but looks like we have some answers then. Uh, so let's see, we've got someone says, the majority of people saying, uh, I wasn't surprised by the results of the process. Okay. Uh, we have some people saying, I was shocked. <laughs> 20 people say, I was shocked by it. Yeah. Maybe you didn't realize, you know, that, that you have these uh, sort of inclinations. Um, some people said, I hadn't taken this test before, but was familiar with it. All right, cool. So what this is telling me is that we've got a lot of different experiences, a lot of people coming from, uh, you know, a lot of different places with this. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, still in the chat, people saying, so familiar, very familiar. I've been researching it heavily for the last month. Plus, I have a master's degree in cultural communication. Way to go, Athena. Surprise. Yeah, and it looks like we have someone who also did a training in implicit bias. I know. Awesome. Let's see. We got Drew Canfield, political science, LGBTQ studies, women's studies, and sociology. Pretty familiar with the IET tool. Very <laughs> like falls into all those categories. Uh, all right, cool. Well, thanks, guys, uh, for the responses. Please keep them coming. Keep that conversation happening in the chat. Um, We'll talk more about the test in a little bit. Um, for those of you uh, who weren't able to take the implicit association test, this presentation will still be helpful, and it's going to provide us with a good overview of implicit bias, um, how to recognize it, and sort of what to do about it. We'll also give you the link to the test near the end of the webinar so that you can go back and take it uh, later on. And it looks like um, I think Alex Grant also shared the link in the chat, so thank you, Alex. Um, once again, um, I definitely encourage you to maybe not try to take it while we're going through the presentation because uh, we won't give you away any spoilers and we won't talk too much about it, so it'll still be relevant for those of you who haven't had a chance to take it. Totally. All right. So um, I'm so glad to see the um, diversity of experiences folks have with this topic. Um, some of you are obviously very steeped in this, and this might be just really basic and old hat for you. Some of you, like you said, have never heard of it, which is awesome. Like, thank you for being here. Um, what I, I really want to just emphasize that this is this is ongoing work, and this is difficult work. You know, we learn from a place of mild discomfort, and it is a process. Becoming a better ally, becoming a you know a, a champion for social justice and equality starts with awareness and reflection, and recognizing that systems of oppression, racism, and power have indelibly shaped our society. They're part of the fabric and the framework. Bias in and of itself shapes our worldview, and it shapes how we interact with society. And the other thing to keep in mind is while we have some folks with some really serious uh, level of expertise, you know, you're never going to be an expert in this subject because it's fluid, it's changing, or, and you're kind of always the metaphor I've heard is sort of taking a spiral path that continually goes upwards. You'll come around, you'll learn, and you'll keep moving upwards and upwards, but there really is no end to it. Yeah. So.
in my own experience, um, as a member of a majority culture, so as a, a white, middle-class female, straight, um, cisgender female, working in diversity and inclusion, this journey for me has been ongoing, and if anything, it's been quite delayed in my, in my career. So also a huge, huge shout out to those of you who have already been steeped in this and have studied this in college. Um, you're really in such a great place. You know, awareness of your own perspectives, biases, and cultural lens is really, as I said, a critical first step towards becoming a better ally and agent for change. And really being an agent for change is what we're in the business of doing. Yeah, totally. As VISTA members, as VISTA employees, as CNCS employees, as national service participants, that's what we are here for. Um, you know, and again, there's no expectation that you know this, but there is an expectation, uh, you know, that once you're aware of some of the issues around implicit bias and all that, and all that, that um, you know, that once you can recognize it, that you try to do something about it. You know, you don't have to be perfect. And again, continual learning process. And most of the time, uh, we're not going to know how we're going to react in a situation uh, until you're faced with that. I know I don't. Uh, you know, so instead of feeling shame, if maybe you slip up, um, maybe make a wrong decision, you know, recognize it, reflect on it, and take it as a learning opportunity. Um, many people, I know on this webinar, I'm sure, and just reading through the chat, I can see that this is already true. Uh, many people have direct uh, and even daily personal experience with this and issues surrounding uh, implicit bias. You know, maybe perhaps you have the language to discuss and dissect it, or maybe you didn't. Uh, so we hope this brief conversation gives you a place to reflect and learn. Um, so let's get started by talking about explicit versus implicit attitudes. Uh, Allie, take us away. Great. <clears throat> so um, attitudes sort of form the basis for bias, so we'll talk a little bit about these. And before we can understand bias in general, you know, like I said, we have to understand both the concepts of explicit and implicit attitudes. So an attitude is your evaluation of some concept, whether that's a person, place, a thing, or idea. Explicit attitudes are ones which you deliberately think about and report. For example, you could tell someone whether or not you like math, and I will say this definitely applies to me, and your behavior might match that assertion. I personally don't like math, and I would be the first to tell you that I am also bad at math. I have avoided math in my academic career, and I am the type of person who, when going out to dinner, I will ask someone else to calculate the tip because I don't like being reminded of my poor math skills. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> In, so in this case, my attitude has very explicitly influenced my behavior, and I'm also very aware of that. All right, next slide. So here's where it gets tricky. Implicit attitudes are both the positive and negative evaluations that occur outside your conscious awareness and control. So even if you say that you like math, your, that would be your explicit attitude, it is possible that you associate math with negativity without even knowing it. So, for example, Calvin might like math and be very vocal about his love of math. I love math. Let me tell you how much I love math. He may understand and believe in why math is important and find ways to engage more with math by taking math classes, reading up on it, etc. However, when it comes time to do math, he might feel anxiety or have trouble actually doing math or feel a vague sense of uneasiness. When it comes to, say, going out to dinner, even though he likes math, he might shy away from calculating the tip. Somehow, there is some unease around his incorporation of math in his daily life. In this case, we would say that his implicit attitudes towards math are negative, even though his explicit attitude is positive. So where did this unconscious negative association of math come from? Perhaps Calvin had a negative experience where he got a math problem wrong and it affected his GPA as a student. Maybe it was a grade school math teacher for whom he has a negative association based off of other experiences. Perhaps at some point in his life, he received the message that he simply wasn't good at math or math wasn't for him. Either way, his implicit attitudes towards math in this case do not necessarily reflect his explicit attitudes and behavior. So follow me down the road here. I'm oversimplifying it by using this metaphor, <laughs> but we'll get there. So we talked about that. Now, how does this translate to implicit bias? Substitute the word math for something else, like race, religion, education level, gender identity, etc., and you can begin to see how deeply rooted and how our biases are formed. Okay. 
So what is implicit bias? You understand the difference between explicit and implicit, right? Like implicit attitudes, implicit biases are unconscious or automatic. Left unchecked, implicit biases can turn into stereotypes against a group. Now keep in mind the implicit associations we hold do not necessarily align with our declared beliefs or even reflect stances that we would explicitly endorse. That's a really important part to keep in mind. So continuing with the math example, even if you say that men and women are equally good at math, it is possible that you would associate math with men without even knowing it. In this case, we would say that you have an implicit math male stereotype. One could say that this presents an implicit gender bias. So hopefully this, this is a bit of, you know, it's a lot of information here, but as I said, using math, but substituting that for any other, you know, sort of sense of identity, you can see how these biases start to form. Why implicit bias is so hard to really figure out is because you're not always aware that you even have these or that you hold to them. You may say, and you know, it's like being very fervent, you know, I love everybody. I'm not racist. I'm not sexist. I'm not bigoted. Well, there's something to that, right? When you think about implicit bias, you start to peel away the layers and recognize, you know, what's going on there. Understand that we're all biased, and our biases are developed through things like in-group experiences, earned beliefs, culture, upbringing, and other outside influences like media. Under certain conditions, these automatic associations can actually influence your behavior, making people respond in biased ways even when they're not explicitly prejudiced. So the test you took, the implicit association test, test you took, is one way to provide insight towards your potential implicit biases in the context of different categories, such as race, gender, ethnicity, religion, or many of the other categories that they put out there. So for those of you who haven't taken the test or were, this was your first time uh, experiencing the test, I just want to give a little bit of background on the IAT. So, and this just really goes into the psychology, it really is a social science psychological uh, research mechanism. So the IAT measures the strength of associations between groups, for example, African Americans or LGBTQ people, and evaluations, for example, good or bad, or stereotypes, for example, athletic or clumsy. So the IAT measures attitudes and beliefs that people may be unwilling or unable to report. So that implicit stuff that we were talking about earlier. The IAT may be especially interesting if it shows that you have an implicit attitude that you didn't even know about. For example, you may believe that women and men should be equally associated with science or math, as we said earlier, but your automatic association could show that you, like many others, just associate men with science more than you associate women with science. So how the IAT works is that you're asked to associate two groups, and for this example, we'll say, African Americans and European Americans with a series of words carrying a positive or negative connotation, words like joy or anger, and match them up to the two groups. Then you have to switch the connotation. So for one part of the test, you might be associating European American faces with negative words, and then you're asked to associate African American faces with positive words, then you switch, and it's, it's sort of randomly generated. The length of time it takes you to match your associations when switching back and forth tells the test a little bit about how your brain works when making associations and attitudes towards groups. I should be very explicit here. This doesn't tell you that you have, you know, you're a racist or this or that, but it is telling you that your brain is having a hard time processing groups of information when they're grouped in a certain way. So the longer it takes you to match an association, for example, the more difficult it is for your brain to reconcile your action thus possibly exposing an implicit bias you may not know you had. Yeah, cool. Uh, so yeah, again, you guys take that test before, <clears throat> take that test at the end of this and check it out. Uh, it's, the, the results are really, really interesting. I, and I can see in the chat, you know, people are, um, you know, saying like, oh, it's like, you know, yeah, the, some people are surprised by their results, and some people say, you know, I considered myself to be this, but the test shows me, you know, as this, so, and that goes back to what you're saying, you know, stated beliefs aren't always implicit beliefs. You know, your stated uh, 
outcomes and mm -hmm. yeah, what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we want to take a time, take a second to um, to share a couple personal stories uh, from Ali and myself, you know, about our own implicit bias. Because keep in mind, we want to underscore the point: we all carry bias, mm -hmm. and we're all learning in this space. So hopefully, to make you feel a little bit more at ease, Calvin and I will share a time where we totally learned a very valuable oh, lesson. Yeah, yeah, and I love learning. Uh, so as I said earlier, you know we all carry this. Um, when I was uh, I was a team leader in AmeriCorps and Triple C, um, I had a team of ten people that I was managing over the course of the year. Uh, we were doing all kinds of different projects, like you know working with Habitat, working with Forest Service, doing all these really hands-on things. One day, uh, someone on my team pointed out uh, that I was giving all of the seemingly easier tasks to the women on the team. You know, these things like painting, gardening, or kind of general site cleanup. Um, you know, and they said that, that the men on the team always got to, you know, build roofs, drive the trucks, use the power tools, and do all the fun stuff. Um, you know, I mean, I, I generally think of myself as a person uh, who thinks that, you know, women and men are equal in all regards. Um, you know, so I took a little offense to someone calling me out like this. Um, I remember thinking, you know, there is no way that I could give the easier task to women just because they're women. Like, that's crazy. Um, they just enjoy doing that kind of work. You know, like, that's what I thought. Um, you know, and that person then pointed out to me that I never actually asked anyone what kind of work they enjoyed doing. Um, you know, so here I was, so sure that I was doing the right thing and giving everyone what they wanted, but I was oblivious to the fact that I never had a conversation about it. Um, after that day, you know, I made a very, very conscious effort uh, to always ask what tasks everyone wanted to do and to take their feedback into consideration. Uh, you know, after a while, it became second nature and really just a normal part of my daily routine and my leadership style. Um, yeah, so, I mean, that was one moment when someone kind of pointed that out to me and I was able to, you know, learn from that, uh, take it, and, you know, and change, change the behavior that I had. So um, I can see that just based on the chat, we're having a very, very good discussion. Uh, first of all, you're all just really awesome people um, for putting yourselves out there and, and having this discussion. So I want to just acknowledge that um, before diving into my own personal story. And then it uh, looks like you have already sort of jumped ahead of us, but we're going to be asking you all for some examples and some of your own reflections in just a minute. Um, one of the things I like to tell people as, once again, a white, uh, straight, cisgender, middle-class woman is that, you know, receiving feedback about your implicit biases is such a gift. You know, usually our actions shut down the conversation or shut down the interaction, and it's really rare that the, per the person who is willing to push beyond and educate the other person in this context. Um, so I've been very blessed to have a couple of situations where I have been given that opportunity to learn from, you know, my missteps and to learn and to help reframe my thinking. And, you know, it's very humbling, but gosh, this is really important work. So in a previous job, I managed a very diverse team. <clears throat> One of my co colleagues who self-identifies as a new American born as a refugee in Africa and I had essentially boiled down to us having an argument about communication styles. And it took me a long time to understand where he was coming from. Essentially, as a manager, I've always asked my team to complete a task in a specific time frame, and personally, I don't sweat the details. I'm the kind of boss who usually says, this is what I want, Here are my, here's my basic expectation, here's the day in which I need it, how you get it done, or the details, I don't really care as long as it gets done. That's sort of how I've learned to be a leader. Um, generally, uh, my team would ask for more information from me, and my response would sometimes be vague because I trusted that they would do a good job and because maybe I didn't have the ability to share all the details. Over time, this made my colleague in, in, in question very upset and unbeknownst to me, I think it had taken him a while to find the courage to tell me that my vagueness was setting him up to fail in his job and undermining his ability. Now this whole time, here I was thinking that I was being a good manager by not being too directive or micromanagey. I, I realized only then that this, that this conflict in my management style wasn't, was based on the fact that I had a very Western type of belief system where as a manager I used my hierarchy to share some information with my employees and withhold bits of other information that I thought was either extraneous or unnecessary for them to know. My colleague, though, on the other hand, has a very, had a very different view of things. He was someone who's very 
nuanced and is able to discern influence and nuance and knows inherently that there's always something more to the story. For him, he felt that receiving all of the details, all the background information, and all of the little side tidbits meant that he could be very fully prepared to do the job to later meet and also exceed my expectations. So the lesson I learned here was I had been managing this employee from my own cultural point of view instead of taking the time to learn and to manage to his strengths. In doing so, I had withheld valuable information and really disempowered him from doing his job. So it was a really good lesson for me to learn, and once we had, you know, that opportunity to have that exchange, I was able to adjust my management style to give him the information and the resources that he, he needed to do the job. Huh. Uh, so, and, uh, you know, thinking about your own experiences, uh, have you ever been confronted by your own bias? I do see some really good chat comments in here. Um, or have you ever had to confront someone else about their bias? Uh, please send any ideas in the chat box and make sure you send it to all participants uh, so, so that everyone can see. Uh, let's see, so Justin says yes to both. We have people in Oklahoma. Uh, cool, yeah, keep that combo going. We're going to move on. We're running a little bit behind on time, so we're going to uh, go ahead, but please keep those chat questions coming. We're reading, and I'm very engaged right now by, by this conversation that's happening. All right, so we're going to talk about cultural lens. Uh, let's see. So, Allie, take us away. Great. So once again, um, I wish we had the time to dive into some of these intense conversations that were going on, and I really appreciate um, the time you're all taking to dialogue and engage with one another. Um, I want to introduce another concept here that's related to implicit bias, and that's the concept of cultural lens. So we discussed how we carry explicit and implicit attitudes and biases, but let's dig deeper into how these are created. So shifting gears a little bit, I want to talk to you about cultural lenses. What are they? These, we all wear one, much like a set of glasses. Our lenses are the mechanisms by which we see the world, and they are shaped and colored by our experiences, beliefs, and attitudes. Your lens is never taken off. Therefore, it's always important to note that the way you see the world is greatly Im impact, the way you see the world is greatly impacted by your lens. It can imp and this, your lens can also be influenced, influenced by your implicit biases, amongst many other factors. So perception is a way of regarding, understanding, or interpreting the way we see the world. Our perception is how we have internalized and computed what information we receive filtered through our lens, our unique individual lens. You may have heard stories about, for example, how in a crowd of people who witness an event, they all may share a common perception of the event, but there will always be subtle differences. Often people will have divergent perceptions of what occurred based on their assumptions, expectations, experience, and history. Yeah, you know, so we want to ask ourselves, you know, how does our lens shape our perception? You know, people are really good at, connect, at quickly connecting the dots. You know, we have all this information, we're always putting things together. You know, we draw meaning from incomplete information and move forward uh, based on the interpretation that we've made. But this is how assumptions are formed. You know, humans, are, we're in a constant state of anticipation, scanning and filling in those missing pieces. But we see what's really not even there yet. Uh, exposure and familiarity speed up the process. You know, the more you see something, the more familiar you are with something, the, the quicker you're able to draw conclusions. Uh, you know, and in a world that demands a speedy response but provides only snippets of information, the ability to create a whole from bits and pieces is a really great asset, I think. Uh, yeah, of course, there is a downside. Um, the moment that we assign meaning to what we perceive, a course is set. We begin to see, interpret, and remember according to that course. The greater our familiarity, the more difficult it is to shift course. Uh, ironically, experience and familiarity, the very assets that drive lightning quick recognition, uh, also can make it difficult to recognize faulty assumptions. We expect a certain pattern, and we quickly confirm or see what we expect to see. Um, so again, you know, another question for you all, you know, how do, how do your lenses uh, shape your perceptions? Um, I think it's, man, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm just like so amazed by some of these chat, uh, by some of these chat responses. You guys are so great. Uh, so we want to know, you know, how does your lens shape your perception? 
Um, let's see, I'm trying to think. I know, you know, from for me speaking from personal experience, I know, um, you know, that I grew up without any brothers and sisters. Uh, so, you know, the way that I grew up was, you know, very independent and kind of having to entertain myself. Um, and I find that kind of pops up in my daily interactions or in my life kind of in general, or it's like, oh, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very, this is a bad thing to say, but I'm very good at blowing off plans. So I'm like, oh, I can just hang out with myself and I'll be fine. Uh, you know, so that's kind of one way that my lens shapes my, inter shapes my um, you know, my, my interactions with people. Uh, let's see, Catherine says, if your lens are small, the key, if your lens are small, the keyhole in which you'll be looking through will be just as small. True? I like that. See. People of color have what is called double consciousness, right? Well, this probably has had less impact on me because I'm mostly working with white people working in Montana, which is fair. And I think that's like a, I mean, if, you know, I think that's a good reflective answer. All right, so keep those coming. Uh, but we are going to take a second to do an activity. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, you know, once again, want to acknowledge these are some great conversations. It, there's a lot going on here. Um, and I mean, I should also just back it up for a second and, and say, uh, I don't think we've had webinars that have really delved into any topics around diversity, inclusion, bias, systems of racism, oppression, et cetera. So this is our really our first uh, foray into this field. And I can already tell we have some Number one, amazing people who have had some great experience and are really uh, fluid in talking about their lived experiences and folks who are really curious um, just based off of what I've seen here. So I'm definitely seeing a, perhaps an opportunity to continue to have these dialogues in the future. So just once again, I don't want to, I know we don't have time to go through what everybody's talking about. I see some amazing folks really like having some great conversations. Um, know that we're going to take this feedback and, and think about, you know, our future programming just based off of a lot of your conversations. Oh, totally, 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 totally. Yeah, you know, someone says, you know, I'm critical of people who are unaware of indigenous culture. I think about reciprocity rather than using someone as a resource or, explo or exploitation. Uh, man, God, you guys are so deep. All right. Um, so we're going to take a second to consider our lenses and see where you all stand. This is just another great interactive activity, um, and this is going to lead us to sort of the next concepts, that what series of concepts we'll discuss. Um, you, re you might remember discussions around cultural norms during your PSO or virtually in any other realm of your life, given this group, <laughs> you're all very well versed. Obviously, culture, cultural norms are the agreed upon expectations and rules by which a culture guides the behavior of its members in any given situation. Of course, norms vary widely across cultural groups. Yeah. Uh, so, you remember those annotation tools, that little arrow that we used in the beginning for the map? Uh, we're now going to read off a series of statements and scenarios. Using your arrow annotation tool we used earlier on the map, place your arrow either in the positive or negative side based on your own personal values. Uh, if you're participating from a phone or tablet, again, the annotation tools may not be available to you. Um, and we do want you to keep in mind that there are no right or wrong answers here, only opinions and answers based on your first reaction. Um, again, you know, this is about those lenses and about where you come from and your culture and your history. Um, you know, some things may read positive to you, they read negative to others. Uh, so we'll see. I'm really curious to see where this group stands on some of these. Uh, so uh, let's get started with our first one. All right, so our first one is crying or being visibly upset at work. How do you feel about this? Do you feel positively? Do you feel negatively? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of negative. We have a couple positives. A lot of in the middle. A lot of people, yeah, kind of telling that line right there. Mm -hmm. So interesting. <laughs> I'm just like so amazed right now. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know for me. I mean, it's like a, I, I, would, I wouldn't say it's positive, but I have no shame around doing it. <laughs> All right, so I'm getting a lot of negative. All right, cool. And a lot of positive. Wow, this is very circumstantial. It is. I mean, it is. And it's hard for us to get, you know, deeper than these kind of really general statements. Uh, but I think you, uh, you know, you get it. All right, <laughs> neutral about crying, why and when. Uh, all right, cool. So good note. Uh, I think this one's kind of skewing towards negative. 
All right, let's clear those and start over. Our next one, leading a meeting with a highly structured agenda. So we'll see this as positive, negative. Um, if you're going to go negative, try to put your arrow way over to the right side so that we can, uh, you know, have that distinct line. Uh, a lot of people say positive a lot. Oh, uh, like everyone's positive on this one. Uh, we got a few people that are negative. Allie, how do you feel about this one? Oh man, I for me. Um Per, my personal preference is I always love it when people have very structured agendas, but I've worked in so many different um, it, like cultural situations where it's sometimes much better to not have a highly structured agenda. So obviously I'm one of those people that, see, that can see the value in this both ways, but right. the purpose of this exercise is just to think about like you personally, so I would say for me personally, positive. Have a Positive, have a highly structured yeah. agenda. Yeah, that's fair. Me too. It's like I'm, I get off track very easily. Uh, okay, cool. All right, let's go to the next one. The next one is uh, standing when a female enters the room. Do you have a positive or negative association with this? I'm really curious uh, because we <laughs> they're all over the place. Yeah. Uh, wow. We um, actually had a discussion about this, you know, during our rehearsal. Uh, that for me, it's a very southern, like, cultural thing where it's like, you know, when your mom, your grandma, your aunt, someone comes in the room, you stand up and say, hey, give them a hug, whatever, and then you sit and then you sit down or, you know, it's just like a very, like, southern thing to do. And other people said, you know, and that it's... I'm like, I don't know, my initial gut reaction is negative because I, I'm like, oh, this is like a symbol of the patriarchy. <laughs> something. I don't know, there's just something to it that I, I, I yeah, so Calvin and I both had very... Um, once again, it's those gut reactions, sort of like, oh, you're like, yes, of course. And I was like, oh, I don't know about this. Yeah. Someone says, uh, I was so super uncomfortable if people did this to me. Someone said every time you walk through, if you walk through the room, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know this was a thing. So, yeah, it's, very, yeah. it's a very cultural thing, I think. All right. All right, our next one is asking for substitutions at a restaurant. Do you have negative or positive feelings about this one? Oh, also all over the map. Wow, I, I see a lot of po I feel I feel I feel like a surprising amount of positive right now, yeah. uh, which is very surprising to me because I'm a very like I'll order from the menu, I'll pick it off, like I'm not going to inconvenience my waiter or my is kitchen staff. Is that because staff. you were a server? It was because I was a server, and that is my lens through which I see this one. Um, I was never a server, but um, I my cultural lens to this one is um, in my at least in my familial bringing is don't make waves. You know, sort of yeah. don't don't put yourself. You know, don't be quote unquote like difficult and oh, take what you will with that. Same, same, same. So, but I, but then on the other hand, I'm like, but wait, if I'm paying for it, I should get what I want. Yeah. Well, and, and that's someone else says, yeah. says, who says you have to accept things you don't like? Exactly. <laughs> like <you know. laughs> good point. Good point. So, so this is my so. my implicit reaction would be negative, even though my explicit is positive. So there you go. That's <laughs> so funny. Uh, all right, so we've got one more, uh, and it is uh, listening to music without headphones in public. Uh, this is one that I am, uh, <laughs> wow, they are going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> most people feel really strongly about this. Some people feel okay, really strongly. All right. So this is extremely negative, negative for sure. Someone does that in my office all day, every day. I would lose my mind. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, but yeah, okay. Yeah, some people that see the good, the good here. I like they see it. See the good in there. Uh, so we're actually going to revisit this question a little, in just a little bit. Uh, so cool. Well, thank you guys so much for participating. Uh, this has been really interesting and very fun to see all of your responses. Uh, so we're going to clear off all those arrows uh, and talk about uh, some culture and, and, and stuff like that. So Ali, take us away. Thanks, and I hope everyone can see the, the diagram here. I know it's a little small, um, but, you know, this is a, we just had, sort of had that fun exercise. We, we uh, talked a little bit about sort of value judgments, and I'm going to dive into that. But, you know, now that we've discussed how attitudes and biases are formed and also that how our understanding of the world is always filtered through our own unique lens and perception of what we see and do, I want to drill down on how we process information that we receive from others. And I personally like the model of the cultural iceberg. This is probably familiar to many of you, and we all know what an iceberg is, and we all generally know that the largest part of the iceberg um, is what lies beneath the surface of the water where we can't see it. What's on top of the water is more smaller and is the incomplete part of the overall picture. 
culture is very much the same way. We have surface culture and we have deep culture. The surface culture items are those which we typically observe, such as things like food, music, fashion, language, and other visual audio representations of cultures or groups. Usually these are merely an external manifestation of the deeper and broader components of culture, the complex ideas and deeply held preferences and priorities known as attitudes and values. How we interact and see the world, the surface culture, is shaped by our attitudes and values, the deep culture. This applies not only to what you absorb in interactions with others, but also what you put out there. The misunderstanding of the motivations of many surface culture items is what leads to intercultural conflicts or just conflicts in general. Um, I want to give a, going back to our value judgments exercise, you might be surprised that all of those scenarios are actually really expressions of deep, not surface culture. Um, so while some of them seemed a little superficial, um, you know, like, oh, you know, communication, they seem superficial like sending food back. Um, things like that, items like communication styles, sense of time, personal space, gender roles, et cetera, all feed into our daily interactions and our manifestations of deep culture. Many of the value judgments we just discussed are from a place of deep culture, which is why we place an emphasis of right or wrong. These are deep, why we, when we interpret these things, place an emphasis of right and wrong, because these are deeply held beliefs and tenets. Taking a step back, how you place judgment on these items is also a manifestation of your deep culture. So I want to give uh, just a quick example. Yeah, before you get to a festival, someone said something uh, that I think is really good, and people are, are, are you know, saying, yeah, good yeah. job. Uh, Emily Grimm says, generally speaking, a cultural value is one that you don't recall learning, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is really, I think that's a really good way to put, you know, that those kind of deep culture things, the things that you've grown up with, and it's your environment, and what you've, you've just, that's, yeah, that's what it, it is what it is. It's like yeah. something that's just ingrained in there. Uh, so good job, Emily. I think that's, 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 that's really good. Sorry, go ahead. No, I absolutely, absolutely. And um, yeah, I mean, yes, absolutely. Um, I will, I'll just give a quick example, you know, of, of my own like value judgment. And we do this every day. We do this constantly. We do this in so, so many different ways that we don't even realize we're doing this. Um, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Guatemala, and um, I lived in a fairly rural village. And I remember not long after I arrived there, um, my neighbors, um, and it would, it would vary depending on who, it did, I couldn't ever tell which neighbor was doing this because I think it changed up um, on occasion, would often play music really loud, like first thing in the morning. You know, 5 a.m., 5.30 a.m., I would hear, you know, bachata or merengue or reggaeton really early um, and really loud. And I remember being awoken by this and sort of just being jostled away, like, what the heck is going on? Um, about a week or two into this um, experience, I remember talking to a member of my host family who's from the community and just saying, you know, what's the deal with people playing music really loud? Like, are, isn't that troubling to you? Like, you know, it's really early. And, you know, I was, you know, honestly annoyed because I just, I didn't understand why people were doing that and why it would happen it wasn't always the same person, so it would happen like randomly by random different people. And my, I think it was my host brother said something really that really stuck with me. And he's just like, well, you know, in many cases, not everybody has the privilege of owning a large stereo system. So, you know, I think people are playing music because they feel like it's their obligation for everyone to be able to enjoy it. If they have the opportunity to enjoy music, then everyone should enjoy it. And I know he said this sort of tongue in cheek and was sort of trying to be sarcastic. But there was something really to that um, that made me pause and realize I was placing my value judgment on a situation that I really misinterpreted. So that's just an example of where, you know, when I thought about the headphones thing, I'm like, oh, yeah, I totally hate when people blast music. And then I realized, you know, it's, it's, it, it's not always what you think it is. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So... Um, that just is a little bit in, you know, in a nutshell, sort of talking about the concepts of deep and surface culture. So, you know, as we said in the beginning, this journey is really all about building your own self-awareness and reflecting on your own deeply held beliefs and attitudes. That's the first start towards understanding and addressing implicit bias, which is uh, one of the place in, places in which you can really start your journey towards being more understanding and um, inclusive. So one last concept I want to just have you consider today is something called the Platinum Rule. 
and you may know this, you may not, but most people know the golden rule. So the golden rule is treat others as you wish to be treated. <clears throat> Sounds simple, right? It's probably something your parents told you and, you know, it made sense, it's very neat, it, and, you know, we've all probably been told, treat others as you wish to be treated. It's a good, it's, it's a good way to sort of take in the world. Well, I'm going to challenge you to throw this away from now on and consider the platinum rule. And I'll put my value judgment, platinum being, you know, more expensive than gold, so we'll say it's a little <laughs> higher than gold, uh, treat others as they wish to be treated. So how do you know how someone wishes to be treated? So listen, I don't know how others want to be treated. That's a great question. <laughs> That's the basic idea of this whole session. You don't. You don't know how others want to be treated. But by acknowledging your lens, your perception, and perhaps even your bias, you might be able to be in a position to learn to view the world as others see it and to adapt your communication and behavior in a way that's inclusive of others and maybe, just maybe, you'll start to understand what other people want. Simply put, it's recognizing that what's good for you isn't always what's most desired or good for others. Right, and how do you know? You ask. You, <laughs> you learn. Ask. You ask, you and learn. And you uh, recognize where you're coming from in that conversation. Why is this important to what we do? Well, I really believe if you're in the business of wanting to help and empower others, you shouldn't be overlaying your own needs and values in order to obtain that assistance. Um, as VISTA members, our mission is unique. We are here to build the capacity of organizations and communities to directly address poverty and to direct it as it manifests at that local level. I always love this quote. Um, I was actually a VISTA member as well. I served in Western New Mexico, so I served in a community that was not my own, that was very different from where I grew up. Um, and I had to learn this lesson the hard way when I was a young idealist 20-something. But I always love this quote by Lila Watson, you know, if you've come here to help me, then you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let's work together. Understanding our privilege, understanding our, situ understanding our biases in these situations help us, helps us to reframe the power distance between us and the people we're working with and to recognize that there are, you know, to really eliminate that power distance and be at a level playing field when we're having these conversations and when we bring our true selves into our work every day. All right, so as we said, this is ongoing work. Uh, so we want to start with, uh, let's start with a few re reflection questions that you can use, you know, in your daily reflections or sorry, day daily interactions. Uh, things like, you know, what is my lens in this situation? You know, how was it informed? Am I making this decision based on facts or feelings? Uh, which I don't want to say that either one is entirely correct because sometimes you have a feeling and you should listen to that feeling. But you know, it's about reflecting and saying, am I making this decision because like, because I'm afraid, like, you know, like just assess that. Uh, you know, ask yourself, would I have made a different decision if I was talking to a different person? Uh, or, or other questions, you know, maybe you guys can uh, share some other questions, you know, for, for reflection in the chat, uh, you know, that might be useful. You know, we want to actively work to understand each other's lens. Uh, so, so um, you know, just looking at all of this in your interactions with community members, are, are they culturally responsive? Um, next steps, you know, we talked a little bit about this. And if you haven't yet, you can take an implicit association test to measure attitudes and beliefs. Um, so that's the link right here. There are many different kinds of uh, IATs you can take. Um, and I definitely encourage you to read up on the subject. Um, for deeper reading on the different types of bias, not just implicit, check out the great write-up of stereotypes and bias and how they manifest in the world. This is actually a full lesson on stereotypes and biases if you have time, so it's worth the read. Um, yeah, uh, MTV, you know, teamed up with a ton of different organizations and advisors for their Look Different campaign. I don't know if you guys have seen it, uh, but it's really cool. There's so many good resources there. One was just pointed out. Uh, you know, if you hear this, you can say this, and it gives you some resources of, you know, how to respond, you know, when you can't find the, when you can't find the right words. Uh, their website, you know, has so much information. They also have a seven-day bias cleanse that you can sign up for via email. Those are the emails. Uh, you know, with tips and tricks on, you know, combating bias. Um, and 
also, uh, we, we're, we're, we shared the link to a uh, NPR story um, about, you know, why women quit science jobs. I think it's really interesting. You can listen to that, you can read it, uh, whatever is your preferred delivery method, uh, but go and check that out. Um, so yeah, again, we want to thank everyone uh, for joining, and we're about to go into our final question and answer portion of the webinar, uh, where we, we have a couple questions queued up from the Q&A. We also have people uh, on the phone. Hopefully, you can call in and, and, and ask a question if you'd like to. Um, but we do want to take a second to ask that everyone complete uh, our, um, our evaluation, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, so, before we go, we want to share with you another chat question. You know, can you share ways to apply what we discussed today in your VISTA service? Uh, Nelly writes, I'm excited for the bias cleanse. Yeah, it's good. You should sign up for it. If someone says, put these links in the chat so we can have them now right? rather than waiting a week for them. All right, we'll get them in there for you in just a little bit. Uh, Indeed, dropping knowledge. Our interpretations of what's rude are different. One can't just treat someone poorly because they perceive the other's actions to be rude. True. Yeah, and you know, I know that we, you know, put a lot of stuff out there, and that I've seen some really good uh, conversation around, even just some of the things we presented. And yeah, you know, that the reality is like, once again, I'm, I really appreciate this dialogue, and that you know, folks are have bringing themselves to this conversation. I think it, this, is a, this is a journey for most of us. Um, many of you have been steeped in this space and have a lot more lived experience than say myself or Calvin. So we really welcome you to continue to put yourself out there and to, you know, in the context of this conversation and know that we really appreciate a lot of the viewpoints and a lot of the thoughts that are being shared today. Right, and I was point you know, too, also Joan says, her answer to the question is, no, not really. This is maybe too basic for what I deal with. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, a, you know, this, is, this is a pretty high level overview of a very large, mm -hmm. very complex and deep topic. Um, so that's okay, Joan. Uh, we ain't mad at you. It's okay. But I hope that, you know, I, I saw you in the chat, um, so I'm really glad that you guys have some, some good conversation. So, let's see. Challenge, so let's just challenge myself to learn, and uh, oh, it went away. I don't know, challenge myself to learn and keep this in mind as I carry out my service. Yeah. Creating a best practices guide for school district that include implicit bias training. Cool, well, maybe some of these resources will help you. I would say that, you, that bias you have, needs to be worked through to help the clients at your organization. I would also say, and this is from Drew, while the only queer woman at work, I would like to know how to professionally intervene in microaggressions in the workplace. Um, thanks for talking about microaggressions. That's definitely something we want to have maybe a session on that in the future. It's something we thought about as a follow-up to this one. So um, I'm seeing some really good thoughts about not only how you could apply some of this stuff now, but um, please, if you have thoughts about what we could talk about in the future, let us know. I mean, we're here to, to serve you all. And um, you all have such incredible experiences and, and perspectives. Um, Really, really love to hear, love to see the level of engagement we have going on here. Totally. And speaking of those perceptions uh, and views, please share with share yours with us. Uh, again, we want to thank everyone that joined. And before we head into our final question and answer, uh, we want to ask that you please complete our evaluation uh, of this webinar. We read every single comment that you guys put. Uh, every single one, uh, I, I pour through them, you know, we're always making decisions based on you and what you want and what you need. Um, so if this webinar today sparked in you something that, hey, I'd like to learn more about that, um, let us know in this evaluation. We can try to bring on speakers. We can do whatever it is that you guys want. Um, you put it in that chat, uh, or sorry, put it in the poll uh, and let us know how we did and we will, um, you know, try to make those things happen. We plan, you know, we do these webinars once a month, so we're always looking for new topics. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, just please take time to fill it out. It really helps us so, so, so much uh, because we're always thinking of you all and what we can do to make these as valuable to everyone as possible. All right, and so we've given you a lot to think about. This this evaluation is, still, is going to stay up on the side of the screen. We need a whole lot to think about. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so you can ask questions using the Q and A panel on the right side of the screen. And I'm going to ask our I'm going to ask our operator Ted to let us know how to ask questions via phone. 
Sure, the phone lines are now open for questions. If you'd like to ask a question over the phone, please press star one and record your name. If you'd like to withdraw your question, press star two. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we've got a couple. Uh, we've got a couple of them um, queued up that came in through the Q and A. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, Donna said, uh, and, this, and this is in regards to the iceberg picture, the cultural iceberg mm -hmm. picture. I saved it. So is this picture to discourage approaching deeper relationships with those very different than we are? And it's complete opposite of what oh, we were getting yeah. at. Uh, you know, no, we want you, we think it's, I mean, it's, I think everyone should think, you know, it's great to approach people with different cultures and values and learn about that and appreciate that. Yeah, and actually that, I mean, the, the purpose of the iceberg is, I mean, we were throwing out a lot of just concepts that I have picked up in intercultural communication and D&I, and so the iceberg is just, it's a nice metaphor for showing, like, that a lot of what we see and interpret through our lens um, is not necessarily just something on the surface, that there's a lot of deeper meaning tied to that. And that you can't, you know, if you're gonna make a value judgment on what you're seeing and what you're interpreting, just recognize where that may be coming from, somewhere of a much deeper hidden source. That's essentially the, the purpose of the iceberg metaphor. Totally. Uh, let's see. And we haven't touched on intersectionality, Jacob. Um, thank you. I think we could spend a whole hour on that, if not more. Yeah. So I'm yeah. writing that down as another uh, topic, for, a topic for another day. I wish we had a lot more time with you all. That's a really big one. Truth says, will these slides be available after the webinar? They will. We will email you a link to this uh, recorded presentation about a week from now. Uh, let's see. We've got uh, Dave. Uh, maybe, maybe we can help. Uh, we'll try, Dave. Dave's question is, how can you deal with difficult clients that are biased towards other clients because of economic status. Man, that's, yeah. whew, that's hard. <laughs> yeah, so let me just get that straight. The client, you have two different sets of clients? That's what I'm reading. How do you, how you deal with clients, with difficult clients that are biased towards their other clients because yeah. of economic status? Uh, that's hard, especially if you're in the middle. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there are a lot of, I would, we can go into um, maybe find some resources and put them on the campus on how to lead discussion groups where you're bringing people together across difference. Um, but it sounds like having um, an open dialogue session to begin with. And um, for those of you, you know, that's something, thank you so much. I, I, I actually, um, like I said, I worked in diversity and inclusion. That's not quite my role here at VISTA, but this is giving me a lot of ideas of like some of the resources that some of us have called together over the years and what we can put on the campus for you to use for um, hosting these kinds of conversations and trainings with the people that you're working with. I mean, to give you something really quick to take with you, um, the iceberg metaphor might be a good one to sort of walk them through. Um, I also like doing value the value judgments exercise. So maybe you have a workshop um, you know, with, with the two groups or independently and sort of walk them through just getting them to think about, you know, oh, these are, these aren't just like deeply held beliefs by everybody. This is my own, you know, value judgment I'm placing. But yeah, that's, thank you. That's something for us to consider for the future. Wow. Any questions? Uh, all right. So let's see, we've got one here that's pretty good. It says, uh, I think this is a hard, this is a hard one too. And I'll try to give it, what, give some advice if I can. So Shalani says, I'm interested in your thoughts on the platinum rule in situations where the people you're working with have mental health issues, and the way that they want to be treated involve a lot of unhealthy and dangerous behaviors or coping mechanisms. So it's a hard line to walk for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the platinum, I should just, you know, big, you know, caveat to everything we talked about today. I mean, it's situational, and I think the platinum rule is, is while it's a nice sort of way to sort of reframe your thinking and it's more about, the platinum rule is more about how you would go about soliciting input from others. Um, but honestly, yeah, in this situation, obviously that doesn't necessarily apply. I think that would be something that, you know, you could look at and it would be more of the reframing of, I know that this is the right treatment for this population. And maybe, you know, you need to take a step back and think, okay, what would be the right treatment? What would be uh, the right sort of a, way to address mental health issues. And I don't want to go too far into this, but my best friend was, is in town and she's a social worker. And I'll give you an example. She works for an organization in, in Camden, New Jersey, where 
um, even though she's a health organization, their focus is on getting the very vulnerably homeless housing and basic necessities, not actually addressing some of the health needs around, say, addiction, mental health, et cetera. Um, so they've totally taken a step back and taken a very different approach of addressing the basic needs first and letting some of the other organizations fill in the gaps for those other needs. Um, so maybe, you know, in a sort of, without having a lot of time to go through this, I think that is an example of where it's looking at, okay, maybe we've looked at this one way, but we can look at this another way. Yep. And I think, you know, uh, you know when, when something's unhealthy and you know when something, and you know when something is maybe harmful, like you can hopefully feel that, you know, and by even asking that question, like you're recognizing that, you know, how you want to be treated, like, I can't do that for you, you know, and it's, and I think it's okay in that situation to say, like, look, like, I appreciate, you know, that this, but, like, I can't do that. I can't provide that for you, not in good faith, not in goodwill. Um, I apologize. Let's try to figure out, you know, something else that will get us the same result, you know, and then work with the person and say, okay, well, what's the need here? What are we trying to fill by doing this behavior, and how else can we, um, you know, accomplish that in a way that's healthy and productive? Uh, but that's really hard, uh, and if you haven't, you know, talk to your supervisor about that. I'm sure that they have experience uh, in the field that you're working in. If, if this is your best project, someone there also has experience, you know, handling those tougher situations like that, and I bet they'd be a really good resource to, uh, to, to, find, some, to find some good answers. Yeah, and um, I saw a comment that I'll probably do a paste a link to. Um, from Jacob, how can we approach or interject ourselves when someone is being overtly discriminated or being yelled at slash attacked? Um, that's a whole other subject called, that I would call bystander inter intervention training. I think um, there's a lot you can do um, around that. I actually will just share a quick link to a comic that was made um, to address um, Islamophobia in the context of bystander intervention, but I think if you Google you know, bystander intervention training, you'll find a lot of really great resources. And I'll put the, the bystander link in the chat here as well. Oh, thanks. All right, let's see. Uh, do we have anyone on the phone with a question? I'm not showing any questions in the queue at this time. All right, thank you, Ted. Again, if you want to ask your question verbally, uh, just press star one on your phone and we will get you in there, we'll get you queued up. Uh, all right, so let's see. Uh, Can you talk about deep culture and problem solving? So much of this is from Kelsey. So much of what we do as this is are to build the capacity of our organization to solve problems. How can we approach this in a way that is good for everyone? That's work. I mean, that is that 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 like that kind of thing takes work, especially when you're trying to appease a large group of people. I mean, it may even come down to you, you know, saying, "Hey, what's the best way to get in touch with you?" You know, like, are you a meeting person? Are you email person? Um, you know, asking asking all of the opinions and then making an informed decision based on the information that you have. Um, I'm seeing the need, I think what, um, you know, honestly, I, the more questions I get, there's a number of, like, different resources I can point to, um, but I, it, I, like, in the context of this chat, I don't want to, like, just cut and paste a bunch of stuff. So I think, Calvin, I think maybe we need to put a section on the campus with resources around this. Yeah, totally. Or, Very broadly. Or in the follow-up to this, we can include a lot more resources yeah. and include a lot of things. Um, you guys have been placing some really good stuff in the chat, um, so, so I'll just try to go through there uh, and compile some of those resources uh, and then send them out to the broader audience yeah. for everyone. Um, I agree, I think that's a good idea. Um, let's see, that, man, I think that's all of the um, Kelsey, yeah. I think, and I, I, I know of some great, like, activities, icebreakers, things like that that I can share with folks that just get people, like get a mixed audience thinking about like just the concepts of like power, privilege, uh, identity, um, bias, et cetera, and maybe, you know, somehow weaving that into any of the workshops that you do, um, that you do as a, every day at the VISTA. Totally. Uh, all right, let's see, I'm not, what amount of time is recommended to conduct follow-ups or check-ins of groups we've met or presented to? Gauge effective implementation or synthesis? Um, that's a really good question uh, that I am afraid that I may not be qualified to answer. <laughs> uh, sorry, I don't know. Um, if, Allie, do you have a comp? No? I guess, um, Leah Jean, if you could maybe uh, maybe add to that. I'm not entirely, I don't. 
fully understand the question. So we could see that yeah. presented to you to gauge effective implementation. Uh, and I think it's going to depend on whatever like the post, project like is. Follow like follow-up surveys or post tests Yeah, I think it's going to depend on what you're working on. You know, if you're working on something that should take a week to complete, then, you know, a, a week and a half maybe to say, hey, did this work out? But if you're working on a really long-range project, it's really hard to say. Uh, because it could be, there could be a number of important milestones, you know, as you're working towards whatever goal or trying to figure out if something was implemented correctly. Uh, that's like a, that's, that's a very hard question to answer generally, um, mm -hmm. just because there's a level of specificity and a level of detail that we just don't have to answer that. So sorry. Uh, any questions on the phone? One last check. I'm not showing any questions at this time. Wow. All right, cool. Well, with that being said, uh, we want to thank everyone so much again for attending. This has been really riveting and great. Like, I've been so into uh, this this chat. It's very fun. Um, yeah, this is, um, you all are really, like, we really thank you for your participation. Like I said, I know that for many of you, this is this is like, you live this every day, you get it, you've been, you know, in it, steeped in it, um, and for some of you, this is your first time even having any discussions, so I just want to thank all of you for really bringing it today. Totally. Um, I, we can have one more question uh, from Christopher. How can we prevent implicit bias, how can we prevent implicit bias training from just leading to unproductive white guilt over apologizing and fear of taking any action to not misstep or take up too much space? That's a great question. Um, I guess, you do know, your research. I mean, do your research. The more that up. you, I think, you know, I, I guess I'll answer that from my own per, like per point of view of someone who, you know, doesn't want to misstep. I think you have to just first acknowledge that if you're in a majority culture, this, even though this might be hard, it's still a lot easier than being, uh, you know, the victim of bias in this in here in the system every day. So I think just like reframing that and just trying to really understand like this might be the first time you're confronted with this. For some people, this is their lived experience day in and day out. They're breathing it. So I think that for me, that's personally helped. If I've ever gotten to a point where, gosh, I'm just, I'm almost paralyzed by my guilt or fear of saying the wrong thing. Like the reality is like, well, I say to myself, sorry, too bad, Allie. Like, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> that's still way easier than people who are dealing with this and living it and, you know, victim to, victims of it. So um, that's been helpful for me, um, honestly, and I, I'm not trying to be glib, uh, Christopher. Um, and I think the other thing is just, like, it's dialoguing, it's talking to people, and, um, you know, just the thing is acknowledge it. Once you start to learn about these things, I think the most important thing is to acknowledge it, put it out there, and then just take steps to educate yourself and to always talk to and learn from people different from you, like in a, in a nutshell. And then, you know, I'm hoping that'll sort of, I'm hoping that answers your, your question. And just read, 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 yeah, learn, read, 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 learn, discuss, like. Again, yeah, this is just, this is a very light Take it touch. deeper, like, you know, patron businesses that are owned by, you know, people of color, minorities, women, um, et cetera, you know, pay, like, Go deeper, like really challenge your own thinking and challenge your own mindset. I think that's really helpful. Yeah. All right. With that being said, we wanna, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Again, thanks for attending. We hope you can join us on our next webinar, uh, which is High Impact Volunteer Recruitment. That's going to be on November 15th, uh, same time, same place. Uh, check the webinars page under Connect and Learn on the campus to sign up for, the, for future webinars. And we really hope to see you again. Thanks, and have a great rest of your day.